What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas, and this is BDG. Big dogs gotta eat. We're talking about waiver wire pickups for week nine. And I originally said I was going to wait until the trade deadline came and passed. That's only because I'm a dumbass, and I thought the trade deadline was at 1 p.m. Eastern time. It turns out it is 1 p.m. Pacific time. I don't know what kind of sick fuck would tweet that out. You know, the world runs on Eastern time, all right? The mecca of the world is New Jersey. So show some fucking respect. Lo and behold, there's still another like three hours until the trade deadline. So we're going to go ahead and really the only thing I, I wanted to wait on, I don't think there are going to be a lot of other moves trade deadline wise that really affect fantasy. Evan Ingram to the Packers, maybe. I won't get too excited about that regardless, but the Deshaun Watson stuff doesn't seem like it's going to happen. If he does end up getting moved before the, or, you know, prior to the trade deadline and moves to Miami or wherever, uh, I will just make an individual video because that will have a really fucking big impact regardless of what happens. So we're not going to wait for the trade deadline. We're, you know, it's 149 right now as I'm filming this. So there's two hours left. So I think we've seen most of the moves that we probably will see going forward. So we are good to proceed. This is a big week. There's a lot going on here on the waiver wire, actually. I think it might be one of the more impactful weeks, low-key, low-key, that we've had so far in fantasy football. If someone wants to be an absolute fucking legend and timestamp this bad boy, remember, the video starts at 0, 0, 0, because it is rude to skip introductions. All right, I'm ready to talk about it. We got quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends that are deserved of your fab dollars if you have any left. So... That being said, let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. And let's eat. First thing to look out for, teams on bye in week nine. We have Tampa Bay, which is Brady, Godwin, Evans, probably not AB, but Leonard Fournette as well. Probably not Gronk with the back tweak, OJ Howard, whatever. Detroit, Swift, and TJ Hawkinson. Seattle, Metcalf, I guess Lockett after last week, and Alex Collins, and then Washington. So you have Terry, you have Ricky Seals Jones, possibly Gibson and McKissick. So a lot of players on by this week. We've got four teams, which leaves a lot of y'all with uh, some big gaps in your lineups. The first gap which should be filled at the quarterback position, is Mr. Taysom Hill, all right? Taysom Hill, uh, I think we're underestimating just how fucking big this pickup is going to be for fantasy right now, especially if you're in a super flex leagues. All of my leagues are super flex to quarterback leagues, which is where I try to gear my content for y'all. Hopefully, I've switched most of y'all over at this point, okay? Taysom Hill. Jameis Winston, you know, despite him doing his fucking best TikTok dance in the locker room afterwards, Torn ACL out for the year. Simeon takes over for the rest of the game. Taysom Hill is in the concussion protocol, but all signs point, a point towards him clearing that for this Week 9 matchup against Atlanta. Crazy stat I saw on Twitter today. 11 of Taysom Hill's 22 career touchdowns have come against Atlanta. Taysom Hill started four games last year for the Saints. They went 3-1. and one. In those four games, his quarterback finishes, fantasy finishes, quarterback 3, quarterback 12, quarterback 6, quarterback 11. He was a quarterback one in every single start that he started last year for the Saints. All right? I'm telling you, we're underestimating how big of a pickup this is for fantasy in super flex leagues. It's like basically getting to pick up Jalen Hurts in the middle of the season. Week nine, you get him for your super flex spots. So if you're hurting that quarterback, go out and spend it all on Taysom Hill. I'm, I'm talking about 40% plus on Taysom Hill if you need him at quarterback. If you want to blow it all, completely fine with that too. I'm telling you, he's going to be a problem for people that you're facing. Uh, I don't want to get die I don't want to dive into quarterbacks really, but like PJ Walker if Sam Darnold doesn't clear the concussion protocol, Tyrod Taylor still day to day with the hamstring, so I don't know if he's going to be back. I don't know if they're going to start him over De uh, Davis Mills if he is back, so just keep an eye on those guys. But the juicy part of the waiver wire this week is without a doubt the running back position. All right, and I talked in depth a little bit about this in yesterday's stream where we were recapping all of the week 8 games. We also have the in-depth fab guidance and waiver wire article on the website right now it is live so if you want all the stats you want exactly what we'd spend and uh 
you know, what fab we put on a guy, whether or not using number one waiver wire priority on it. We do an exclusive article on that every single week available bdge.store forward slash community. It's also where you'll get our weekly rankings that drop every Thursday. It's the only place to get them. You'll get into our Discord, which is where you can join uh, BDGE Dynasty Startup Leagues in the offseason. We've got a whole bunch of gang shit going on. BDGE.store forward slash community if you want to know how much to drop on Mr. Boston Scott. So this tweet from John Daigle. Eagles running back touches through three quarters while building a 34-0 lead Sunday. Boston Scott, 12. Jordan Howard, 12. Kenneth Gainwell, 1. In the fourth quarter, Gainwell, 12. Scott and Howard, 0. So, despite the box score of them all being even in touches nearly, uh, Gainwell did not get any of his work until the fourth quarter. It seems like it's completely kind of at least has the Miles Sanders role, which is crazy considering, you know, we've seen Gainwell get plenty of playtime throughout the year so far up until this point. I personally wouldn't be surprised at all if, like, next week Gainwell gets a lot more touches when the game actually matters. They go up against the Chargers. There will be better game script for a guy like Gainwell who's a pass catcher. You know, Boston Scott is obviously the guy you want to own after last week. We're not gonna we're not gonna get cute and try to push against the grain here, but. Uh, it becomes pretty messy, right? Boston Scott was super useful because he scored two touchdowns, but so did Jordan Howard. And Jordan Howard's going to be involved in this offense. Uh, we've seen them be comfortable using Jordan Howard in previous years and now in this game. Boston Scott in previous years and now in this game. It's tricky because, again, the game script worked completely against game will in week eight. And we're not really sure what we're going to get on the goal line here between Scott and Jordan Howard. They both scored two touchdowns. They're both involved down there. Jordan Howard is like the thumper bigger than than Boston Scott so it becomes a little bit tricky which is why I'm not going all in on this backfield because again I wouldn't be surprised if this turns into a three running back by committee Gainwell's more involved going forward against the Chargers and the teams that are not the Detroit Lions so Boston Scott would be a top pickup this week a top pickup not the top pickup um, but I'm not going to go crazy on him I would say 10 to 15 percent on Boston Scott maybe a little bit more if you're really desperate at running back I'm not looking to pick up Jordan Howard um you know he has like the James Conner role in an offense that kind of sucks so kind of good there Gainwell I would hold on one more week and see what his role is if again it's shitty like it was this week leave him leave him in the fucking gutter top pick of this week obviously Adrian Peterson uh Jeremy McNichols is also interesting because Derrick Henry probably out for the year um AP is fucking old as sin. Old as sin. But remember, he scored seven touchdowns last year on the Detroit Lions. All right? He's going to get a laughable amount of carries with Tennessee right now as the early down guy. And he'll be fine. I'm telling you, there are going to be plenty of... There are going to be a handful of like 14 carry, 55 yard, two touchdown days for AP incoming over the rest of the season. This is a good Tennessee offense that gives the running backs goal line opportunities. All right? This will be much more of a committee, though, than we've obviously seen with Derrick Henry there. McNichols will be the pass catching back. And I started to dive into this because I'm like, you know, how big of a role will McNichols have? And I think up to this point, they don't trust him at all as, as like a pure running back. He is strictly a pass catcher. He has nearly four times as many targets this year, 27, as he does carries, seven. All right. So he has seven carries on the season, 27 targets, which is crazy if you... Stat that out to a 16-game pace. McNichols is on pace for 62 targets, which would be, that would have been top 10 last year uh, amongst running backs. Most of that has to do with the 12-target game against the Jets, obviously. So it is a little bit skewed, but it still tells you that, like, they see him as a, sorry, as a pass catcher, and that's the role that he's probably going to have going forward. Uh, He is an explosive athletic playmaker. He has some upside. I just don't think that the Titans will let him see that at all in the run game. I think they're really comfortable with Adrian Peterson, and Peterson's going to take 60% 60% of the carries that Derrick Henry had. So I look at AP as like a low-end RB2, high-end RB3 flex play moving forward with some pretty good touchdown upside. And McNichols is like a PPR guy, all right? So they're going to have to go much more pass-heavy without Derrick Henry here. They got nothing behind A.J. Brown in the receiving game, right? Julio Jones, who knows how long he's going to be out for. And when he comes back, does he re-injure it again? They don't have a tight end of consequence. They don't have a wide receiver three of consequence. So it's like, where else do they fucking throw the ball? So we might see games where McNichols sees six, seven, eight targets going forward. So I think he's a good PPR play as well. AP would be my number one pickup this week if you're not in need of a quarterback where Taysom Hill is uh, moving forward. Jeremy McNichols would probably be behind Boston Scott for me, but I don't really blame you if you want to drop, you know, 10 to 15% on McNichols as well in a PPR league. Then you've got some like floating around kind of backs with Carlos High strictly because of James Robinson's heel injury. If he does miss week nine, he is day to day, so I don't really expect it, but it's possible. 
Um, they play Buffalo in week nine. So it's not like, you know, you could think of them as anything more than just like a shitty volume flex play. That being said, though, with the buys, man, there might be teams out there that have like DeAndre Swift, Leonard Fournette, Antonio Gibson, Chris Carson and shit like that. So you might be desperate. So Carlos Hyde, I guess you can go pick him up. Ty Johnson, you know, Michael Carter is obviously the back to own in New York. But Ty Johnson now has 13 targets, 11 catches, 136 receiving yards over his last two games. And Mike White is the absolute fucking check down god. And you might think Michael Carter is pulling away with this job, but the snaps are still very, very much like this between the two Michael Carter had 52 percent of the snaps on Sunday Ty Johnson had 41 so they're still there he's a PPR ad for sure I wouldn't use him in like standard um, but he'll get you probably eight to 12 points in PPR Ty Johnson will as long as Mike White is under center Jared Patterson it just I mean they do have a bye this week so it might be just like let him rest and then play Antonio Gibson the week after that it feels like only a matter of time before Antonio Gibson gets sidelined uh, either they put him on the IR or they just let him rest until he's ready to go because last week was pathetic. He got like one or two touches and then it was like Jared Patterson and J.D. McKissick out there as a running back. So Patterson, I feel like, is someone that he's more of a luxury hold at this point. Uh, one, because he's got the buy. Two, because we don't know what the Gibson deal is. But if you have room on the roster, you're in a deeper league. Jared Patterson should definitely be owned at this point. And then we have the Gore dynasty. The Gore dynasty lives on with Mr. Derek, Hor- uh, Mr. Derek Gore of the Kansas City Chiefs last night. Balled out a little bit on Monday Night Football against the G-Men, man. Not a single person, not a single motherfucker out there knew who Derek Gore was prior to last night. Okay? Everyone immediately was like, even uh, Michael Strahan on the Manning cast was like, yo, Frank Gore signed with the Kansas City Chiefs? And ever, I was like, yeah, wow. I, how did that slip me by? How did that, that not get like the play it deserved on fantasy Twitter? Lo and behold, it's Derek fucking Gore. And I'm not going to lie. Last night, he looked like what we wanted CEH to look like the entire year. But when you look at Gore, his profile, he's 25 and a half years old, runs a 4.68 40, not a good burst score, not a good agility score, undrafted free agent out of like Louisiana, Monroe, 5'9", 206. I don't think he's it. Clyde can technically return from the IR in week nine. I don't think that's going to happen. I think his injury is probably closer to a four to six week injury return. Um, And it seemed like Gore was a big time part of the offense last night, but he only played on 19.8% of the snaps. Uh, He took an entire drive where he got like seven rushes and turned it into 41 yards and a touchdown. Really nice goal line touchdown with a nice cut. And that's where it looked like CEH reincarnated as a better version of himself. Gore's probably worth picking up. It seems like he jumped McKinnon as the RB2 or will at least quickly going forward. The only problem is like Darrell Williams is still the main pass catching guy in this backfield. Six targets last night, six catches, Um, you know, caught all of them. Gore got zero. So I don't see a scenario here where like we see Gore getting 60% of the touches or 60% of the snaps in this backfield. Darrell Williams still very, very involved in the important parts of the field. But I think Gore definitely needs to be owned because who knows, man, fantasy is fucking crazy. There's always league winners and crazy players that come out of nowhere towards the stretch down the stretch run and maybe Derek Gore is that guy you know I think Al Gore probably had a better chance to win the race and this fucking Derek Gore has got a chance to win this race but who knows who fucking knows Derek Gore pick him up if you got some room let's move over to the wide receiver position I'm not going to go in depth on everybody but the guys that I'm looking at uh at the top of the list would be Rashad Bateman if he's still available on your waiver wire for sure, because he could become a bigger and bigger part of this offense and a mainstay of your lineup over the last six weeks or so on Baltimore, of course. Michael Gallup, I'm not as interested. This team's just not as pass-heavy as, as we expected them to be, and Cooper and Lamb are just both such an integral part of this offense, getting like 20 targets a game. Uh, Dalton Schultz has like emerged as their, as their basically wide receiver three as Gallup has been out. So I'm not like crazy about Gallup, but he's like worth talking about, worth picking up because he'll probably be back next week. Jamison Crowder, I think, is a really interesting pickup with Mike White under center because just like with um, Michael Carter and Ty Johnson, like check down, check down, check down, check down. That's where Jamison Crowder went off. He had, I think, eight catches for like 85, 89 yards or something on Sunday, and that will continue to be the case because Mike White is not throwing the ball down the field. Corey Davis will probably be back. Maybe not. He might not be back in week nine, but if he is back, like they're such different players, and I don't think Mike White really trusts himself downfield and on the outside of the hashes. So I think Jameson Crowder continues to be like a pretty solid PPR play uh, with Mike White under center. We have Devontae Parker, who came back, had a big game with Tua, and this was exactly what I was talking about on Sunday where you get no consistency from the Miami receivers as long as they're all healthy. Gesicki, Waddle, Parker. Fuller's not back yet, which would make it even more messy. 
on the outside there. Uh, I don't think he's going to be back this week, but when he does return, it makes it crazier. So it's not like I'm not jumping out to get Parker. I'm not super excited about that because the next game he might go four for 40 and Waddle goes 11 for 85. So it's like really hard to find consistency. I think they're both like wide receiver fours or so going forward. You have the Atlanta Falcons wide receiver two role with Calvin Ridley out. It's like Tajay Sharp, Russell Gage, Russell Gage, Tajay Sharp. You know, we need to see something more out of either of these guys to get excited about throwing them as even a desperate flex play. Everyone got excited about Matt Ryan and the Falcons and Kyle Pitts and whatever after games against like the Jaguars and the Jets. It's like fucking relax, okay? Re fucking lax. These guys aren't going into your lineups right now. Jamal Agnew kind of falls into that same role. He's like overtaking LaVisca Chenault as the wide receiver two here. I do whatever you want with Jamal Agnew. He's not touching any of my lineups. But the one the one wide receiver I do want to touch on, and I kind of was uh, a little bit less bullish on him yesterday in the live stream than I'm going to be right now, and that's Van Jefferson of the Rams. Van Jefferson is a guy who it's going to be really hard to trust him to see any sort of consistency, but he randomly has these big games where he goes like, I feel like this is every big game from Van Jefferson is the same stat line. It's three for 85 and a touchdown. And it happens like every four or five weeks. But a few things have taken place in the last couple of weeks that I think are worth mentioning for his rest of season outlook. One, uh, Deshaun Jackson requested a trade, so they're not going to be using him in their lineup, I don't think, at all going forward. Tutu Atwell is now out for the year with uh, a shoulder injury. Who would have seen that being a terrible pick going forward? With Van Jefferson, he's way behind Robert Woods, Cooper Cup in the pecking order, of course. Don't need a fucking brain surgeon to tell you that. But the Rams run three wide receivers or more on the field a league high 86% of the time. The, no other team is like within eight percentage points of that. So they have Van Jefferson's playing basically 86% of the time with no Tutu Atwell, with no Deshaun Jackson. Uh, he's, you know, no one else is getting snaps there besides Van Jefferson as that third wide receiver. So he's going to be on the field all the fucking time. Okay. So Van Jefferson is getting serious play time. He's starting a connection with Matt Stafford. Uh, no Tutu, no, no D Jack. So Van Jefferson, I feel like if there's one guy on this list that has a little bit more upside than the rest of the guys, I, I kind of think it might be Van Jefferson. So I like him as a sneaky ad this week. At the tight end position, I mean, you have Pat Fryermuth, who's actually, you know, despite him being a rookie, he's led Pittsburgh tight ends in snaps in every week except week three. So Eric Ebron out last week. He had a midweek hamstring pull, uh, which kept him out. And that probably tells me he won't be ready for week nine. I could be wrong, but like, you know, Thursday or Friday, hamstring pulls usually tend to be at least 10 days, 14 days of rest. So if he's out again, like you got to really like Pat Fryermuth as like the go-to guy at the tight end position there, especially in the red zone. Big Ben loves him there. Uh, so Pat Fryermuth becomes like the top tight end pickup this week if Dan Arnold is not available. Actually, I'd probably take Fryermuth regardless, but Dan Arnold needs to be picked up. I've been saying this for weeks now. Um, 10 targets in this game. He's consistently being like really, really involved in this offense. It seems like it's like Marvin Jones. If Marvin Jones gets involved, then Dan Arnold. Like that's that's like the pecking order right now in this offense. And I, I see better days ahead for Trevor Lawrence and this passing offense altogether. Especially if James Robinson misses time, they're going to have to go pass heavy. So, um, yeah, that's that, those are really the only two tight end pickups I see right now that are, are worthy of talking about unless Darren Waller misses another week after the bye week, which I don't expect to happen. But if he does, Foster Monroe becomes a very, very good pickup, of course. And, uh, and that's it for the waiver wire this week. Want to run through it quickly. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. And I'll see you all tomorrow unless... Something happens in the next two hours with Deshaun Watson. Then I will see you like 35 more times.